I'd like to tell you the story of a revolution that happened in cosmology around the turn of the century. But before I get going, I want to give some background. So we'll start with what I was taught the first day of grad school, just before this revolution happened in around 1998. So the first thing I was taught is that the universe is expanding. If we look at galaxies near and far, they're all moving away from us with a pattern that is consistent with universal expansion. But if today the galaxies are moving away, then if we run the clock backwards, of course we would expect that the galaxies would move together, and in the very early universe, you would have a, a very hot, dense state. Uh, we call this the Big Bang, uh, or more, more specifically, the hot Big Bang. And there's lots of evidence for this, but the most striking visual evidence is the cosmic microwave background. This is a picture taken by the Planck satellite this year, and you're looking in the microwave wavelengths at the whole sky, you're seeing the relic radiation from the Big Bang itself. So those are the first two. The third thing that I was taught in grad school in 1998 is that the universe is decelerating. So this is easy to understand. If you take a ball and you throw it up, as soon as it leaves your hand, the only force on it is from gravity pulling it down. So it's going to slow and slow and slow until it stops, and eventually it's going to fall back down. The same is true for silly people that we launch out of cannons, fortunately for them. Um, now, you might argue, well, there's a counterexample. What about a rocket ship? It doesn't fall back down, usually. Um, and that's true. Um, but that's because we give it such a high initial velocity that you know, it's able to, it is able to escape, because the further away it gets, the less the force of gravity is on it. But it's still decelerating. There's still a force on it down the whole way. So with that sort of understanding of gravity here on Earth, um, cosmologists for decades, since we learned the universe was expanding, cosmologists tried to figure out what is the future of the universe? Uh, and so we, we sort of parameterize that. We sort of show that on a plot like this. Um, this is the size of the universe versus time. So there's the Big Bang at the beginning of it all. And here we are today. The universe has expanded to this point. And the question is, what will happen in the future? Will it be like the ball that you throw up, which has the universe get um, bigger and bigger and bigger to some maximum point, and then stop, and then collapse back down? This is called a big crunch universe. And this makes sense. It's like the ball going to a certain height above the Earth and coming back down. It's the same idea on a universal scale. Or is it going to be more like the rocket ship, where it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the universe, forever, just slower and slower every day? So, you know, and it could be somewhere in between. It could be the green line. But these were the two extreme possibilities that we thought could happen based on our understanding of gravity, even as late as 1998. Um, now, we might say, you might ask, how do we know it's slowing? Why can't it just expand at a constant velocity? Well, that would look like this straight line where every day the rate of expansion is the same day after day after day. Uh, but we know that's not the case, at least with analogy with the ball. If you throw a ball up, it's not going to go at a constant veloci velocity all the way up and off into space. It's going to slow down. And the reason we think the same principle, or we thought, the same principle applied in the universe is, let's say we're in either universe, the one that's going to go only to a certain size and then recollapse, or the one that's going to keep expanding forever. In either case, let's do a, a thought experiment and pretend we're living on a galaxy on the leading edge of the universe, right on the edge of one of these circles, expanding outward. And if we think, what are all the forces on us? Well, if you're on the leading edge, all the forces are, are from all the matter behind you that's pulling you back and slowing you down and not letting you expand out as, as fast tomorrow as you did today. Right? It's, it's the same principle of deceleration from the gravitational attraction from all the other mass in the universe. So we thought we knew we were decelerating. And the question is, which curve are we on? Is the universe actually going to recollapse one day, or is it going to expand forever? And this was a problem people tried to answer for decades, but only in the 90s did the technology allow us to make this measurement, figure out the deceleration rate. And so conceptually, it's very simple. All we have to do is take a GPS device, attach it to a galaxy in the early universe, let the universe expand until today, and today we just read off the measurement. How far away is that galaxy? And if we could do that, we could figure out the future of the universe. And to see what, why that works, let's conceptually imagine two cases. In the first case on the left, we're in this universe that is going to crunch back down. It's going to expand to a certain point and then stop and fall back. And in the second case, it's going to keep getting bigger and bigger. Now, in both cases, we're looking at the universes in their past. We are at the center on the red dot, and the white dot is the galaxy that we attach the GPS device to. So we let the universe expand and get bigger over time, and what happens? Well, 
the one that's the smaller, you know, the big crunch universe is going to get bigger, but not so big because it's slowing down to a stop. And by today, the distance between us and that GPS galaxy is, you know, yay big. Um, if, on the other hand, we're in the other universe, which is expanding much, much bigger because it's not slowing down as quickly, it's going to be a bigger universe today. And the distance to that GPS galaxy is going to be bigger, right? So we can figure out which universe we're in by just measuring the size, the distance to, distance ga to distant galaxies. And, um, and that's the whole trick. That's easy to do, uh, except, oops, except that we, what are we going to use for a GPS device? Right, that's the hard question. And so the answer is supernovae. The universe gives us the tools we need. A supernova is, of course, the end stage of a star, not all stars, but many stars, will explode and, and turn all of their mass into uh, energy and light. And the supernova at the, on the left is one that went off in a nearby galaxy about 30 years ago, and you're looking at the remnant. The one on the right is actually in our galaxy and hasn't yet gone off, although it looks really um, intense. It's going to go off in a few million years. And there's properties of supernova that allow us to use them as this kind of GPS device. The most important one is that for certain classes of supernova, we know how bright they really are. It's as if we can look at the light bulb and read off it says 100 watts. And if we know how bright something is, you can always figure out how far away it is, right? Um, like with a light bulb, if you know it's 1,000 watts and you push it 10 times further away, it's going to only look like 10 watts. It's going to be 100 times fainter. So it's the same idea. If you know the brightness, you can figure out the distance. And so for the supernova on the right that went off in this galaxy, you see that bright spot at the lower left. That's a supernova. And that allows us to know the distance to that galaxy very precisely. And there's a second thing about supernova that are really helpful for this cosmology work, is that they're just intensely bright. So if a supernova goes off in the distant universe, we can still see it, and we can measure the distance to that galaxy. So great, all we have to do is find supernova in galaxies, and we can measure the distance to them, and we can figure out what universe we're in. But the problem is supernova are pretty rare. A supernova in a galaxy like our own, and that's our neighbor M31, or Andromeda, which is quite like ours, uh, it only goes off once per century on average. So sitting around and waiting for that would not be an efficient use of telescope time. So instead what we do is we have a strategy where we look at hundreds or thousands of galaxies every time we, 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 we do an experiment, every week or so, and on average we know some supernova will go off. So that's the strategy we, we take. Um, and the group that I'm part of in this game um, has opted to use galaxy clusters as a neat and easy way to find thousands of galaxies in one single pointing of the Hubble Space Telescope. So what is a galaxy cluster? There's an example shown here. A galaxy cluster is just a big collection of galaxies, right? Thousands of galaxies. Each orange, or sorry, um, golden um, fuzzy blob there is a galaxy 10 times bigger than our own galaxy. And there are thousands of them that all live in the same um, gravitational well. They're like a, a bunch of busy bees buzzing around each other, and they live together. And so all we have to do is find these galaxy clusters and look at them with the Hubble telescope every week, and some supernova will go off. But this one is relatively nearby. This one is only 2 billion light years away. And so we want to find things that are way further than that to do our experiment. And this is my contribution to this work. I tend to use infrared space telescopes to find galaxy clusters in the distant universe. And here's three examples. The one at the lower left is 8.8 .8 billion light years away, 9.2, and 10 billion light years away. So these are far enough away, we're seeing them as they were when the universe was less than half its present size, clear across the universe. Now, the one on the left and the one on the right are being searched right now on the Hubble Space Telescope for supernova. The one in the middle we did a few years ago, and let me show you what it looks like. I'll zoom in on the core of this galaxy cluster, and the image on the left in the black and white is the first image we took when we started this program, just the reference image, and then you see the one on the right, a supernova has appeared. It's a little off the top, there's a red arrow you can't quite see. Um, and so you can see that supernova has appeared. And so we know the distance to that galaxy extremely precisely because of that. So this is the basic idea. Let's take pictures of galaxy clusters every week, some supernova will go off, and we can measure the distances. So here's a result from 1998. I don't usually show uh, science talks uh, you know, in this sort of venue, but this is not a science uh, plot. This is a, a historical plot now um, because this is the first evidence that was convincing and has held up for the existence of something very strange in the universe. So the plot on the y-axis is the distance to these supernova, 
And on the x-axis is how far away in the universe we saw them, one billion years in the past, eight billion years. And let's look at this, uh, this upper right corner, which is where all the action is. If the supernova, if we lived in the universe that was going to expand to some point, stop and collapse, then the distances to those supernova would not be, they wouldn't be so far away. In fact, we would expect them to lie on the bottom black model, the bottom line. But they don't. They're further away than that. Right? They're higher, which is further uh, distance in this plot. If we lived in a universe that was continuously getting bigger, but just slower and slower every day, that it would lie on the middle uh, line with all the dots, the dotted line. But it's actually, believe it or not, slightly higher than that statistically. It's consistent with lying on, lying on a line above that, that we didn't even really know what that was at the time. But let's look at it in our, in our schematic. We, we're looking, we, we, you know, the supernova went off in the past, and we measure the distance to it today, and we find the universe has just grown dramatically bigger than we even imagined. The distance is much further away to that supernova. And the only way within the math to make it work is to conclude that the universe is not slowing down that the universe is, in fact, accelerating. It's actually speeding up, expanding faster and faster every day, which is very counterintuitive. It's like if you throw a ball up in the air, and instead of it going up to a certain height and falling back down, its velocity increases faster and faster until it goes off into space, never to return. That's, that's sort of what this means, which is obviously not what anybody expected. It's counterintuitive. So, you know, in case you don't believe the data, that was pretty ratty data that I showed you. We've done this over and over again, both with supernovae, well, with supernovae and with many other methods, but I'm just sticking to the supernova for this talk. And on the left, you see many, many distances to supernovae that all agree with the top line, which is that model that says the universe is accelerating. And more recently, in 2012, there's a compilation of dozens of different projects you know, hundreds of supernova, uh, and they all follow the model that is the accelerating universe model. That's what the black line means. Um, we don't even show the other models anymore because we know they're not right. The universe is accelerating. And in fact, the red points at the upper right are from the cluster search that I was describing, and the most distant red point, nine billion years in the past, is that supernova I showed you. So with all this evidence in hand, it was inevitable that the Nobel Prize in Physics would be awarded for this discovery. And it was awarded to the two teams that were doing it that independently found the same results. Uh, and the, to quote the Nobel <coughs> Committee, for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe through observations of distant supernovae. And those are words that I hope, you know, we, we, you, know you have a feeling for what they mean now, having, um, having seen this talk. Um, so this is a very bizarre state of affairs. Um, what is our destiny? I said we should lie on one of these curves. And in fact, that's wrong. We lie on a curve that is accelerating. The universe's size is getting bigger, faster and faster every day. The expansion is accelerating. So what causes this? How can a ball just launch up into space like that? Well, it's not something that happens in our experience here on Earth, obviously. We only see it when we look across the universe. It's a, it's a process that, that is uh, cosmological in nature. What causes it? The truth is we don't really know right now. We do have a name for it, though. We call it dark energy. And it goes back to an idea that Einstein had in 1919. He put this into his general theory of relativity. And the idea was that space-time itself just wants to expand. It, it's not happy sitting there. It has to just be expanding all the time. So that if you have two galaxies that are not actually moving, really, the space between them is going to expand, and it's going to look like they're moving apart from each other. And in fact, faster and faster all the time, they'll be accelerating apart from each other. And he thought of this in 1919, but there was no, at the time, well, a few years later, there was no need for it. There was no empirical evidence that this happened, so he discarded it. But now it's back in a big way, and all our evidence is consistent with this explanation. However, since then, other theories have developed, and this could also be a weird quantum effect. We know there are quantum fields that permeate all of space and time, electromagnetic field, um, the Higgs field that produces the Higgs boson, the inflaton field in the early universe that causes inflation. So these are, these are ideas that are well established. And this could be a kind of quantum field instead of, a, pro of a, a property of general relativity. We don't know. We have to discover the difference because it has huge implications for the future of the universe, as I'll show you. Uh, but first, let me, let me point out it's hugely important. Um, you know, all of the physics, all of the biology, all of the chemistry that we've ever discovered you know, in all of human scientific endeavor, accounts for 5% of the stuff, the matter, the energy in the universe. Another 23% or so 
is something that only astronomers know about, <laughs> that we discovered it, it's called dark matter, um, and it's a kind of particle that doesn't interact with light, only gravitationally, and we know it's out there because we see galaxies that, are, uh, that have stars spinning too fast, and in clusters, galaxies are moving too fast. There's more gravity than we can account for, and the source of that gravity is this dark matter. That's another talk, actually. <laughs> um, today I'm talking about the 73% of the universe that we didn't even know about 20 years ago. And yet it's 73% of the universe um, that is dark energy, that is causing the universe's expansion to accelerate. Um, and so this is obviously a very compelling and important question in science, but just to point out that you know, for every person on Earth, this is philosophically extremely um, interesting uh, and important. This is an image that, you, that we've taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called the Ultra Deep Field, and it's an image of thousands of galaxies, near and far, red and blue, all different shapes. Uh, and it's, you know, you see only four stars from our galaxy are actually visible here. It's like the dirt on the window that we're looking through. It's in the foreground, those four stars. Um, and the thing is, since the universe, its expansion is accelerating, those galaxies in a few billion years, maybe seven times the age of the current universe, will be moving away from us so fast that their light can never reach us. They'll be moving faster than the speed of light, and they'll actually just disappear. So if we were to keep looking at this spot in the sky for 100 billion years, it would kind of look something like this. And the only thing left would be the stars in our galaxy. There'd be no other galaxies that we could see. And not only that, the cosmic microwave background will disappear. So in fact, scientists who are trying to understand the universe 100 billion years from now will not have any way to, to will have no evidence that there are any other galaxies. They will have no evidence that the universe is expanding, and they will never be able to determine that there was a Big Bang. So that's pretty big stuff that comes out of um, you know, the, the, logical, um, the logical conclusion we draw from the effect dark energy has. So it's, you know, it's super important that we understand more about it. I'm just gonna summarize the dogma that has been ditched by cosmologists around 1998, and in this talk, um, in historical context, for, for, and for, since antiquity until 1929, we assumed the universe was static, unchanging. In 1929, we realized it was expanding, but we thought it was slowing down, decelerating. And in 1998, we realized, in fact, it's accelerating. There's this dark energy stuff that's really pushing everything apart faster and faster, and will have profound influences on the future. So the question that is you know, running through all of our minds every day is what is dark energy really? I mean, we have a name for it, but what is it? Can we understand it? Is it Einstein's idea? Is it a quantum idea? What properties does it have? So to answer that question, we're building telescopes that are gonna, you know, designed to go up and measure dark energy's properties. This is the Euclid telescope. It's being designed for launch in 2020. Um, and I'm happy to say that UMKC is playing a role in this. I'm part of Euclid. So uh, I'll come back in a few years and let you know what we found. Thank you.